ARM is increasing its footprint, no pun intended, in the cloud native and edge space, which also means there is a need to secure these workloads. Aqua recently announced that its cloud native security platform now protects containers and virtual machines workload at runtime on ARM powered devices. To discuss not only this announcement, but a broader uh, kind of security in cloud native, especially with the ARM, we have with us Rani Osnath. Vice President of Strategy at Aqua Security. Ronnie, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you. ARM was already making a kind of serious inroads in the cloud uh, data center, but recent announcement by Apple to move its own Mac line to uh, ARM-based Apple Silicon has kind of renewed discussion uh, in ARM, not that there is a change in the interest. Uh, so I want to hear from you, what are your thoughts? How do you see uh, the increase of ARM's footprint in cloud and edge? There are several use cases that drew our attention, and this is why we um, ended up uh, supporting ARM uh, as a security, you know, as a runtime security solution for for cloud workloads. Um, we um, we first encountered ARM as uh, an active participant in the community around cloud native technologies, the CNCF, Docker, and so forth. Uh, more recently, um, together with AWS, ARM announced um, a new type of EC2 instance called Graviton2. Uh, which is kind of a high-density uh, VM that's based on ARM architecture that allows you to run. When we say high-density, we mean you can run more on a single on a single uh, instance, uh, which is great for very work-intensive workloads, uh, and it's also more cost-efficient. Uh, so companies that are doing a lot of kind of heavy computation stuff in the cloud. Uh, are starting to use that, uh, and it saves them. You know, I don't remember the numbers, but it's somewhere between somewhere around thirty percent of cost, and makes it more efficient uh, to run uh, things like containers uh, in the cloud. So that's one use case. Another use case is around IoT uh, or edge devices. Um, I mean, we all know that you know things, even things like mobile phones, run um, ARM chips. But uh, in this case, we're, what's more relevant to us is more industrial IoT, you know, things, anything from cars to wind turbines to machinery. Uh, a lot of these things are now, uh, you know, digitally controlled, sending tons of data, uh, and basically have small Linux servers in them. And those Linux servers are often based on ARM architectures. And uh, and those two are now getting containerized, running Kubernetes. Um, there is a distribution, for example, uh, by Rancher, which is now part of SUSE, called K3S which is the lightweight Kubernetes version that runs on IoT devices uh, and edge devices. And the third use case, which um, uh, is still a bit further out for us, but it's starting to catch on in the market, and uh, there are lots of discussions going around how to do it well, is around the uh, 5G networks that are based on Kubernetes. So basically, software-controlled uh, or software-defined uh, 5G networks, um, and those two um, are heavily kind of real-time computation uh, intensive, and, and this uh, is also a, 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 another area that ARM uh, architecture is, is being used in. Yeah, I, I think 5G is going to kind of start a new set of movement altogether. Last year, uh, government also kind of democratized. Uh, they released some spectrum, which allows companies to set up you know, their uh, 5G networks. Um, if you look at all these use cases that you mentioned, Yes, these are exciting use cases. You mentioned benefits, are uh, their performance and all those things. But uh, they also uh, obviously pose uh, new security challenges which are not seen in uh, traditional architecture. Uh, talk about uh, what kind of concern is there from security perspective when you do see the increase of ARM in data center edge, when I look at edge, I look at edge data center, not just IoT devices. And of course, there are other new use cases as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, especially when we talk about um, cloud native workloads, um, they're made to really run anywhere. And there's a decoupling of uh, the application layer from the infrastructure layer. And so security really has to be structured in a way that supports that. You can't. You don't have that persistence you used to have, where you knew that you had a server 
you know, number 31 in that rack in a server room uh, that ran SharePoint, and it's been running SharePoint for the last three years. That doesn't exist anymore with, uh, with cloud-native uh, deployments, and, and it's, it's all automated, orchestrated, um, and it can run in one location one time and another location another time, and, and these uh, variations can happen within spaces of minutes. It's very ephemeral. So from a runtime perspective, uh, you have to have controls in place that are able to basically follow the workloads and secure them based on um, a zero trust approach, meaning you, you have a context of what they're supposed to be doing, and then you can easily detect uh, drifts in their behavior. Uh, and that's, that's what Aqua does in the runtime. The other aspect of this, uh, which also impacts, uh, has some architecture, uh, 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 you know, an impact in terms of uh, what you run is the whole development cycle. And the development cycle is also very much changed. It's uh, a lot more agile. It's more automated. There's what we call CI/CD, continuous integration, continuous delivery. And you no longer have this very structured waterfall of creating releases for applications where at the end of that cycle, you go into an extensive security testing that takes several weeks and then you can release. So there, there are much shorter cycles, sometimes several times a day, and every change in code also needs to get approved and, uh, and, and you have to be sure that it's trusted. Uh, so even there, there are some differences in some cases between um, you know, ARM-based images and uh, images are, are kind of the static version of, of containers uh, in the build phase. So there are, there are some changes between that and, and the x86 uh, type Linux uh, uh, operating systems as well. So even on, on that level, there is some support. And of course, when you go, I mean, there, there are solutions that can be very agnostic uh, to cloud because they're very lightweight and they don't actually do what we call workload protection or workload security. Um, they're, they're looking from the inside, from the outside in. But uh, solutions that go deeper, like Aqua's solution, um, we, we you know we, we embed ourselves fairly deep in deep in that stack so that we can first of all detect uh, at the process level what containers are doing and also stop processes that we think are um, you know not legitimate. And to do that, you have to go fairly deep in the stack, and that's why supporting something like ARM is is not trivial. You know, it's, it's there's an effort involved and. Uh, and we think that supporting it is important. That's why we made that uh, that investment. Looking at ARM architecture itself, uh, when we look at, when we talk about SA six, you know, we're talking AMD and Intel, and the whole uh, I don't want to go back, but uh, the whole meltdown and all those things happened. You know, some chips were affected, some were not affected. When we look at ARM, these are custom chips. You know, it, it, Amazon may be doing their own thing, Azure might be doing their own thing, Google may be doing all, their own thing, and then we are talking about edge devices, edge data center where you know there are different vendors. Vendors. So, so that itself poses. Though there is a lot of standardization happening in the R space. I do remember Linus Torvalds in the early days. He used to be very, very upset with ARM, but now there are uh, nice work is going on there. But do you also see that as a challenge because every instance on every cloud is also different? Yeah, right. So in our case, not so much uh, because uh, the lowest we go is the operating system level. <clears throat> so we do need to support those operating systems that support ARM, those, those versions, those builds that support ARM 64-bit in this case. But um, once we did that, um, the, the, you know, the, the, as long as there is uh, compatibility between the operating system and the chipset, we're fine. Um, we don't go lower than that. And so really the burden is on the Linux distributions, on the cloud providers, and so forth. And in the cloud also, you know, from a, a shared responsibility model, you know, the, the the security model that they tout, they really take care of the infrastructure level. That's that's what they do, right? I mean, that's the, that's that's the part that they take care of unequivocally. Um, so they will make sure that the operating system is hardened, that the um, uh, that it's up to date, that it's compatible with what they're running, and anything above that is usually the customer's uh, responsibility. And that's where Apple comes in. Right, exactly. You explained it properly. Now uh, let's just go beyond this discussion and just look at 
cloud native in general. We have had this discussion earlier also with Aqua that uh, security in cloud is not an afterthought. It used to be traditional IT. It is becoming part of CI CD pipeline itself. A shift left is happening, you know, zero test network is. So a lot of things are already happening. How do you see evolution of security? And I'm not talking about te technological solutions which are already there. I'm talking about people's uh, <laughs> challenge. So let's talk about uh, how it has evolved over here. Yeah, I've had several of those discussions uh, with customers and and analysts uh, over the last uh, few weeks, actually, that it, it, it comes in waves. Um, there's uh, definitely, you know, the, the, the notion of DevSecOps has definitely permeated. And when we talk about DevSecOps, we're not talking about a specific, a specific method or a specific practice or a group of people, right? I mean, there's no, uh, it's not something you could just slap a label onto. There are many ways to do DevSecOps. I think the one thing that everybody agrees on and is that it's some way, it's some collaborative way of embedding security into the DevOps process. Uh, whether you do it through integrated teams, cross-functional teams, uh, security specialists within the DevOps teams, or DevOps specialists within the security teams, that really, I mean, you know, there are many ways to uh, to get there. They're all, I think, equally legitimate as long as you do them well and as long as they they fit your organizational culture. Uh, but this is a shift that's happening for sure. And a lot of security efforts are being shifted that way. Um, and if a few years ago, this was more of kind of a, you know, a nebulous term. Um, nowadays, you know, we, we see people, there are people with DevSecOps titles or people with DevOps security titles. So um, it, it really has caught on along with a set of, you know, uh, automation tools and, and, and ecosystem that really supports it, both open source as well as commercial solutions. And, um, uh, but, but from a kind of organizational and process standpoint, uh, we're definitely moving in the right direction. We're not there yet, but it's uh, a lot better. I mean, it used to be a dirty word almost. Like you, you, you went, especially when you went to security teams and you said DevSecOps, they were like, you know, don't, don't get me into that. But that was a few years back. Now, I think um, people really embrace it on both sides, by the way, on the DevOps side and on the security side, because they both understand it's a win-win. You know, DevOps are not going to be able to accelerate and continue to uh, push things forward in the way they want to unless they take care of security up front. And security know that if they just continue having things thrown over the wall at, you know, at them after they're ready for production, they're going to be in the position of slowing things down. And we think that in this age, security should be more of an enabler, not a blocker. Right. So, uh, but, but we're definitely heading in the right direction. We're, we're, we're in much better shape overall, the market. In my discussions with a lot of uh, companies and folks is that uh, the emergence or, you know, shift towards SREs as well. Because if you look, uh, essentially, what does a uh, security breach do? Disruption in services, right? And and you have to keep the business continuity is critical. So do you also see, of course, we keep hearing new buzzwords, DevSecOps, Dev, they will keep coming up. But what kind of shift do you see? I mean, you already alluded to some of those things that, you know, sec peoples are taking that seriously. But do you see any cultural shift where uh, it's like, you know, from the very beginning, the, because, you know, if you start practicing these things when you write the code, because once you deploy your code on billions of instances, then it's too hard to track it down versus when you start from, you know, the CI CD pipeline. So what kind of uh, patterns, trend, paradigm shift you're seeing from the culture perspective? It's interesting you say that because even internally, uh, we've set up uh, an SRE team, right? We've had a DevOps team, uh, and now we have an SRE team as well to run the SaaS platform that we uh, use with, with our customers. And um, although SRE is not a new thing, I mean, it, it hatched in Google some years ago, probably a decade, maybe even more ago, um, it, it's becoming more of, a, more of a trend, I think, to, because, you know, DevOps is a big bucket. So within that, SRE is kind of a specialization. Um, and, um, and I think it's, it's catching on more as people simply need to manage more in the cloud, you know, more automation uh, and, and keep things floating, right? Keep, th keep things running. Um, from a security standpoint, I think one of the interesting things, we, we talked about shift left, but another, another um, trend that we see that is uh, very 
tied to uh, the shift we just talked about with SREs is the concept of shifting left infrastructure security. So what's known as infrastructure as code uh, security. So it's not just the application code you're looking at. Uh, and you know, as, as you're developing code, you're actually, you want to make sure it's free of severe vulnerabilities and that you know, it's properly configured and doesn't have any kind of embedded secrets in it and so on and so forth. But also the templates that you're using to automate how you deploy applications to set up Kubernetes clusters, to set up um, AWS environments or, or you know, GCP environments and so forth, things like Terraform and, and uh, CloudFormation, all of those things also have uh, a security impact if they're not done right. And so we're now shifting left that aspect as well. Um, and so together, you're looking at the application layer, you're looking at the infrastructure layer, and it's a much more kind of complete uh, approach. Uh, one more thing that is happening is that uh, if open source kind of democratized software, cloud has kind of democratized using that software. Uh, and when we look at security, a lot of things are happening. Traditionally, security folks were not open source folks, but that has also changed. So let's talk about from ACPOS perspective, you folks do whatever you do is mostly open source, or all of it is open source. So let's talk about the open source angle that is there. Yeah, so ACPOS has a unique model actually around open source. It's not everything we do is open source. We have commercial products, uh, but we look at open source as a way to accelerate market adoption of security practices. Um, you know, first of all, a lot of our users, DevOps teams, um, are open source users. So they're used to using open source uh, to begin with. Um, and on the security side, we feel that because this is a, a learning curve, you know, we've gone through, Aqua's been around for five and a half years. Um, and, and we, we, we see the market moving, but there are processes within organizations that take time. So for us to come into an organization that's not ready for cloud native, that's not ready for cloud native security, and just push commercial solutions on them, is you know it's, it's not likely not to work right out of the gate. So there's an education process, and a lot of this education process can happen through open source. So it's kind of a grassroots adoption of open source tools like vulnerability scanning or hardening of Kubernetes clusters or uh, tracing uh, events in, in runtime and so forth. So uh, we created basically like an ecosystem of security tools that are open source and are um, it, they stand in their own right. So you can use them um, uh, to, to solve specific problems. You don't need to buy the Aqua commercial solution to use them. But if you want uh, you know, a holistic approach that's integrated, has all the, you know, enterprise bells and whistles, single sign-on, reporting, uh, deeper functionality, you know, easier policy management, and so on and so forth, uh, then you would go for the commercial solution, but you'll only do that when you're, when you have that need. So it's kind of a self-selecting maturity model for us, right, where companies will come to us when they're good and ready, um, and then, um, you know, we're not kind of forcing commercial solutions on them. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we're still very much a commercial company, right? We're, we're here to, uh, we, we need to uh, make money or we won't exist. And so um, the model is really not one of like services around open source, like some companies have, but it's, it's open source tooling that leads to a more uh, mature usage that then uh, in most cases requires a commercial solution because not many companies can handle the integration and ongoing upkeep of multiple open source tools. Uh, they tend to be either kind of very small or very large and very kind of cloud native, you know, people like, I don't know, Netflix or, or Twitter. But if you're not Netflix or Twitter and you're not a small startup and you're somewhere in the middle, which is most of the market, it's very likely that your ability to um, effectively use open source tools over time will diminish and you'll need some sort of commercial solution to tie it all together. Rani, thank you so much for taking time out today. And we talked about not only ARM announcement, we also went deeper into how the whole landscape for security is changing in the cloud network work and um, what role is Aqua playing there. And of course, we also talk about the open source at Aqua. Thanks for your time and I look forward to talk to you again. Thanks very much for having me.